don't have the traffic. Like, I honestly live 800 metres from my office and I drive to work. And I drive home for lunch. It's just You drive, so oh, well, well, well. You drive, drive home, home like, for lunch. Because yeah. the bus is always yeah. late. Yeah. yeah. I'm, right. Just, right. I'm fantasising about that. But they're fantastic places to live. They're got, we've got good internet. We're a nice, welcoming community. And if you've got any sort of skill, you can really you can make a difference. Well, I, love, I, love the fact I love the fact they've got a good old cup of tea shop, those towns, you know? That's yes, right. They're still... Half from Auckland. Centre of Auckland, hour and a half down at Te Araha. Another one here, Wairua, completely underrated, Verity. So you ha- you have not been to Te Araha. I, uh, I thought Book about Book yourself I into a spa. In Christchurch. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, the, it really is. Because I'm a spa man. Yeah. And I go around the country having them. And you won't get a better spa. I don't know what they do. It's, it's natural, isn't it? The water's natural there. It's natural water, but there's no. it's not muddy or anything like that. It's crystal clear. It's got all the minerals. They, when they, back in the 1800s, they did analysis on it and said they likened it to the Parisian spas. Oh. Yeah. Is it as beautiful? Are they going to be very glamorous French men, partially naked, high hanging around, having a cigarette? Can I come down for that? Potentially. Potentially? Yeah. Okay, look, you've convinced me. You've convinced me. Give us a heads up. It's in the, it's in the business plan, Sean. Um, finally, just before you go, um, you know, uh, is the future bright? Because, you know, there's a there's a, a 10 seconds, there's a, the cost of living, people are doing it tough. Oh, it's essentially bright here. We've got the cycleway, the Haraki cycleway comes through, so you can Good cycle you. from um, the Firth of Thames to Matamata. Matter. We've got the mountain, we've got walking, there's bush, there's rivers, there's, it's got everything going for it. Kia Very good. Nice. Sean and Neil there from uh, Te Araha there. And wonderful panel to you both. Phil O'Reilly, Verity Johnson, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Great to be here. Thank you. And to Tim Miller, my wonderful producer. Wallace Chapman here back tomorrow, 3.45 for the panel. Checkpoint with Lisa Owen next. This is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Now, Heidi Akine muscled out the door. Sacked Cabinet Minister Stuart Nash won't be standing at all next election. And there's more on the investigation into his donor dealings. The Prime Minister wants lobbyists to lose their keys to the parliamentary castle. 80 of them have swipe cards for the side door. Calling Elon Musk, one of our biggest telcos, signs on with Starlink to end mobile phone dead zone. CEO Jason Paris is live. Let's hope the connection holds. Is the pay for nurses in Australia as healthy as they say? And one to hook you in a delightful array of crocheted chook hats. We talk to a chicken milliner. Yep, it is a thing. You can watch us live on the RNZ website. RNZ News at five o'clock. Ahi ahi maidie. Good afternoon. I'm Evie Ashton. Sacked Cabinet Minister Stuart Nash will stand down from politics at this year's election. The Napier MP has made a series of mistakes, the latest being revelations. He disclosed secret Cabinet conversations with two donors. Our political reporter Annika Smith has more. Stuart Nash's political fate was all but sealed last week when the Prime Minister stripped him of his portfolios and told him to think about the future. Mr Nash had told two donors about confidential cabinet discussions in 2020. It appears he then breached official information laws in declining to provide the email documenting this to a journalist a year later. In a Facebook post on his personal page, Mr Nash said it was now time for someone else with passion and drive to step up. He will serve out the rest of this term as Napier's MP before standing down from politics after the election. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has revealed the terms of reference into the review of Stuart Nash's communications with his donors. Chris Hipkins says the Cabinet Secretary's review will look at letters, emails and texts and messages sent via WhatsApp and Signal. It'll cover the dates between the 26th of October 2017, the day Mr Nash was first sworn in as a minister, and the 28th of March 2023, the day he was sacked. 
A nurse recruitment specialist is warning that lucrative short-term contracts in Australia could leave some New Zealand nurses worse off in terms of their professional lives. 5,000 New Zealand nurses have registered to work across the Tasman since August. Tonics Health Recruitment Managing Director Kate Natras says the Australian contracts can pay up to three times more than nurses are paid in New Zealand, but she says sometimes there's little backup if things go wrong. My concern and what I'm hearing too is some of these nurses feeling professionally unsafe. They are left a lot in isolation. They don't feel that well supported. Kate Natras says the recent equity pay boost for New Zealand nurses helped to close the gap with Australian-based salaries. The Prime Minister wants to strip lobbyists of their easy access to the corridors of power as part of new measures to improve transparency. Roughly 80 individuals across businesses, unions and NGOs have swipe card access to Parliament's building. Mr Hipkins has asked Parliament's Speaker to remove them. My view is that they should go through the front door like every other New Zealander. Chris Hipkins has also asked officials to explore options to regulate lobbying and to report back next year. In the meantime, he's encouraging lobbyists to develop a voluntary code of conduct. The actions follow an RNZ investigation into the conduct of lobbyists and their communications with MPs and government agencies. The Christchurch Adventure Park is considering its future after the appeal court ruled it must pay millions of dollars to people whose homes were damaged in the 2017 Port Hills fire. The park has lost its appeal to overturn a previous court decision launched by dozens of homeowners and worth more than $12 million. The park says given the amount of the ruling, it's considering its options. The head of Russia's Wagner mercenary group has raised the Russian flag over Bakhmut's city hall in eastern Ukraine. Yevgeny Prigozhin says Bakhmut is now Russian. In a social media video, he said he was displaying the flag as a tribute to a pro-war blogger killed in a bomb blast in St. Petersburg. It is the 2nd of April, 11pm local time. The building behind me is the city administration. This is a Russian flag. It says on the flag, in memory of Vladlen Tatarsky. From a legal point of view, Bakhmut has been taken. It is ours. The enemy is concentrated in the western parts of Bakhmut. There have been 12,202 new cases of COVID-19 reported over the past week, 944 more than the week before. A further 25 deaths have been attributed to the virus. 5,149 of the latest cases are reinfections. To sport now and defending champions, the Pulse will be hoping the netball gods will finally smile upon them when they play the competition-leading Mystics in Podidua tonight. The Pulse have suffered one-goal losses in their last two games. Yesterday, they went down to Magic 48-47. The Mystics have won four of their five games so far. The Pulse sits second to last on the ladder with just two wins. All-rounder Daryl Mitchell is confident the Black Caps can still win the T20 cricket series against Sri Lanka, although he says building depth will remain a focus during the remaining games. The tourists won yesterday's opening game in a super over after the scores had finished tied on 196. Mitchell says winning is the Black Caps' number one priority, but he says instilling the team culture in the new players is an important aspect of the series. We love to win series for our country, but at the same time it's about trying to get better and as a group and we know we've got a young group here at the moment who hasn't played a lot of international cricket and we'll try and make sure we concentrate on winning the little moments and doing the things that we believe as black caps are our values and and hopefully that means we do win some games of cricket and, and win a series. Game two is in Dunedin on Wednesday with the third and final T20 in Queenstown on Saturday. And today's dismissals of football managers Brendan Rodgers and Graham Potter by Leicester City and Chelsea, respectively, mean this season has set a new record for Premier League sackings. The number of sackings has now reached 12, with the previous highest number being 10. That's the news. A shortage of radiation specialists. It's really precarious because two are in their 60s, one is retiring, the other two, I understand, they are looking around. Gaps in the defence force. It has now got so dire that they're having to shut down certain capabilities because they don't have the staff. And a lot of these are highly trained roles. And a dearth of nurses. And the reality is now that having to leave the family behind to go overseas is real. Plenty of news. Morning Report, weekdays from 6 on RNZ National. 
You're back. You are with Lisa Owen. Next on Checkpoint, right now, the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Tuesday. Northland to Whanganui, including Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty and the Central High Country. Isolated showers today, possibly heavy and thundery about eastern Bay of Plenty, fine tomorrow, apart from early fog patches and a few showers about western Northland. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, showers becoming widespread and heavier this afternoon with thunderstorms possible in the north becoming fine tomorrow. From Manawatu to Wellington, also four weighted upper, scattered showers clearing to fine this afternoon or evening. Nelson and Marlborough, isolated showers today, mainly fine tomorrow. Buller and Westland, mostly fine today, cloudy periods and isolated showers later tomorrow. Canterbury and Otago, mainly fine, a shower or two about the eastern Otago tomorrow afternoon. Southland and Fjordland showers about the fjords and south coast, isolated showers elsewhere tonight. And for Dekohu, Chatham Islands, often cloudy with showers. The time is seven minutes past five. I'll have traffic news and headlines for you at 20 past five. Nā mihi, Ivi. Tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai haere mai ki Checkpoint te tēnei rā, ko Lisa Owen tēnei. Lobbyists may no longer have swipe card access to Parliament under changes suggested by the government this afternoon. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins has admitted there's a perception problem and hopes the changes will make things more transparent. It comes after an RNZ series exposed Aotearoa's lobby industry is considerably less transparent than its international counterparts. I've commissioned a significant piece of work that will look at policy options for regulating lobbying activities. To do it well, that will require consultation uh, and a good amount of time. I anticipate that that advice will come back to government next year. The Prime Minister says he's asked the Speaker to remove swipe card access to Parliament for more than 80 lobbyists. Mr Hipkins says it's clear some changes are needed. New Zealand has a a very good reputation internationally, you know, as a a transparent and corruption-free or relatively corruption-free country. Um, But that doesn't mean we can be complacent about it. Perception is incredibly important here. Mr Hipkins says the government will also refresh the Cabinet manual and help lobbyists to set up their own code of conduct. Our political editor, Jane Patterson, joins us now. Uh, Kia ora, Jane. Why have they done this? Lisa, uh, the lobbying, uh, you look at the lobbying is because there was um, concerns really about perception of influence, of undue influence and also access by lobbyists to Parliament that the Prime Minister has decided to have a look at. Of course, this comes after reporting from RNZ that raised the issue of lobbyists. Were they able to access ministers? Were they having undue influence? So basically, there are going to be a few things that um, the Prime Minister is going to look at and firstly it's going to be to uh, ask the Speaker of the House to look at the access that about uh, the Prime Minister said about 80 people have um, in various lobbying roles to Parliament and see if that swipe card access should be removed. He's also asking lobbyists and he calls them third party lobbyists and these are the ones who work for those big PR firms or the big lobbying firms. Um, He's going to ask them to be more transparent so to voluntarily for example put the list of their clients on their website so people including ministers know exactly who they are representing and in whose interests they are acting. He's also flagged a broader piece of work to have a bit more of a a look at the lobbying situation in New Zealand to be carried out by the Justice Ministry. And that could look at things like a cool-off period like we've seen in other jurisdictions or, or other tightening up of the lobbying sector. Jane, it's a little bit more than perception, isn't it? If you have 80 individuals who have this free access to Parliament with a swipe card, I mean, to put it in perspective, what happens if you're a member of public and you're going to visit someone? Oh, that's right, and they were exactly the questions that the Prime Minister was asked uh, last week about lobbying because uh, the line that they were running at that point was, well, look, lobbyists have no, you know, no more access than Joe Public. But the point is, if you are a member of the public um, coming in and trying to get a meeting with a minister, uh, good luck. But also when you arrive at Parliament, you have to check in, um, you give your name and you go through the security checks. Whereas with these swipe cards, you can let yourself in um, and have complete access really to Parliament, not, not offices and that sort of thing, but the general precinct. And a lot of the lobbying happens um, when in more informal events um, and the lobbyists' access 
access is a lot easier with those swipe cards. So that's going to be the first thing. The Speaker of the House has to actually agree to that. But that is the first step. But look, the the voluntary code of uh, conduct is pretty much a, a wet lettuce leaf. I mean, that's really not going to do much and it's voluntary. So that's not really a big step. There could be bigger implications in that look, that broader look. But that's going to be well after the election into the future as well. And Jane sacked Minister Stuart Nash. Oh, he's surprised. He's not going to seek re-election. That's right. And uh, last week when the Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, was talking about him losing his job as a minister, he was also asked about Stuart Nash's future as an MP. Of course, he remains the MP for Napier, and that's not up to the Prime Minister or anyone else to remove him from that position. But he came out this afternoon and said that he would not contest um, or he would not stand for that seat after the October election. Now, Chris Hipkins said last week that uh, Stuart himself will be reflecting on his position. I imagine there'll be further conversations with the party. Pretty much those comments really signalled that he had been given the strong message, go away, have a think about it, and, you know, really um, your future as an MP is pretty much over. It avoids a by-election. Stuart Nash had already ruled that out himself last week. He said he wouldn't step down. Um, the The period is coming up pretty closely where he could step down and not cause a by-election. Um, however, that's the last thing that Napier needs. And also Stuart Nash, you know, will be able to potentially do a valuable job really concentrating on his constituents in the run-up to October, but has made the decision um, they will have to select a new candidate for Labour. He's been selected for that seat, so they'll have to go through that process again, but he has drawn a line on his political uh, career come October. Thanks for that, Jane. That's RNZ political editor Jane Patterson. It is 13 minutes after five. Kia mo tonu mai. Do stay with us. You're listening to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Some overseas trained nurses are using their New Zealand registration to leapfrog straight into a job in Australia. Meanwhile, health recruiters say Australia and Britain are getting increasingly aggressive about poaching New Zealand nurses as hospitals everywhere struggle with staff shortages. Ruth Hill reports. A Wellington man who recently spent a week in hospital with a broken leg says staff was so stretched he resorted to keeping track of his own pain medication. The hospital was massively understaffed especially the nursing side of it. They were all complaining about um, being unable to find people to cover shifts and having to work longer than they expect and having less nurses than they need, etc, etc. The patient, whom RNZ has agreed not to name, says his first night was agony as he was put on a continuously inflating mattress while in traction. But I was at the point of swearing at people at two in the morning because I wanted for them to turn the bed off. And there was definitely a language barrier there. I think it was a combination of that and they didn't actually understand how the equipment worked and what it was doing. And so I spent the whole night with the bed inflating and deflating and it was quite painful. At one point he was put on nil by mouth by a doctor who thought the wound was infected and he needed more surgery until the patient pointed out no one had changed the dressing so it just looked infected. And at the time I was thinking I'm like geez if I wasn't as coherent as I am they might put me under the knife for no good reason. He says the nurses were all doing their utmost to provide the best care to patients. But one stood out more than anyone else and she was the one who came in and changed that dressing at 6pm when it was prescribed to be changed at 6am and coincidentally that was her final shift and she was off to Australia for better pay. Another patient who's currently in Middlemore Hospital says the nurses are invariably cheerful and caring when you actually see one of them. They're short staff, there's you know, hardly anyone here but then the whole system's broken too, it's not just the nurses, it's, I don't know, just not conducive to a patient's well-being because of their short staff. 5,000 New Zealand nurses have registered to work in Australia since August. However, the grass may not be greener over the Tasman. Since the pay equity boost, base rates for more experienced nurses are equal or higher than in some states of Australia. Tonics Health Recruitment Managing Director Kate Natris says short-term contracts in Australia pay two or three times as much, but they're often tough gigs in the outback where there's little backup if things go wrong. My concern and what I'm hearing too is some of these nurses feeling professionally unsafe. They are left a lot in isolation. They don't feel that well supported. New Zealand is short about 4,000 nurses. 
Kate Natras says they're in short supply globally and both Australia and Britain are working hard to entice New Zealand nurses to staff their hospitals. She admits some overseas trained nurses are using New Zealand as a back door to Australia, sometimes without ever working a shift in this country. We are finding we're putting quite a lot of resources into supporting them to get their New Zealand nursing council registration, but then finding that they are using that to go to Australia on. So we, we try to sort of filter that out as best we can. But then too, we sort of hope that maybe, you know, they'll see the light as well and come back and, and use that registration to come back into New Zealand. Kate Natras says New Zealand has a lot to offer overseas nurses, not just in terms of pay and conditions, but with culture and lifestyle. And the fat nurses have a pathway to residency and can settle here with their families. Ruth Hill reporting there. One of the country's biggest telcos has dialed up Elon Musk to help with Aotearoa's patchy cell coverage and end black spots. One New Zealand, previously known as Vodafone, has signed a deal with, the Mus- with Musk's US firm SpaceX, meaning its mobile network will work with the company's next generation Starlink satellites from late next year. Due to the country's unique geography, one says only about 50% of the land mass currently has coverage. And recent Recent extreme weather events have raised serious questions about a lack of network resilience after comms went down for days in some areas. One New Zealand's Chief Executive, Jason Paris, joins us now. Kia ora, Jason. You've got about 30 seconds. Give us the elevator pitch for this deal, please. Uh, kia ora, Lisa. So uh, 2024, 100% uh, mobile coverage to all of Aotearoa, right out to the territorial boundaries. First with text then with uh, voice and data. Um, It'll mean that uh, even though 98% of where New Zealanders live and work are connected with 4G and 5G connectivity today, 50%, as you said, of New Zealand's landmass doesn't have mobile coverage, that problem will be solved. And then if we do have any more natural disasters where power cuts lead to broadband or mobile cuts, uh, people will still be able to connect with their loved ones when they, when they need to. So it's a technology that will save lives. At what cost? Will customers have to pay for a special subscription or will it be a regular part of your package if they're signed on with you? It's not the plan that they'll uh, have to pay extra uh, for this. So again, it's life-saving uh, uh, technology and so uh, we want to bundle it in to our existing plans and give as much, uh, many customers as, uh, uh, as possible access to it. Uh, it's still 12 months, 12 months away, but that's certainly our, our intent, Lisa. And um, At a higher price than they would be paying now, Jason? Are you going to charge them more for it? That's not the plan at all. Okay. Yep. So uh, the, yeah, the plan is to bundle it in with um, our most popular plans. But as I've said, still 12 months away, but the definite intention is that this is a service that should be accessible to as many New Zealanders as possible uh, and, and affordable uh, as part of their current uh, plan. When you say 12 months away, you're referring to text messages, right? And voice is going to take longer than that. You need some second generation satellites to be launched. Um, yes. And also, I note that SpaceX has filed documents with regulators in order to launch extra satellites. Talk to me about the degree of certainty or uncertainty here in terms of getting this up and running. Yeah, well, as you'd imagine with um, something this important, uh, we've looked at all uh, satellite uh, providers um, and we're confident that uh, SpaceX has the track record to launch in 2024. Our engineers have been working with the engineers for uh, quite quite some time now. They've got um, a president in the New Zealand marketplace. A number of New Zealanders have already uh, experienced the Starlink to broadband service, and the Starlink to mobile service will be just as uh, successful. They've already got 3,500 um, satellites uh, in, in space um, and, uh, and are going to be launching more with those mobile antennas on them. So look, we're being we're giving ourselves a little bit of a little bit of leeway by saying 2024. It gives us right to the end of 2024. We'd like uh, we'd like that to be earlier than that and then voice to uh, follow quickly after that. What happens if Elon Musk has a tanty and decides to switch New Zealand off because it wouldn't be the first time he's threatened that kind of behavior? Um, well, I don't think he will. I, you know, the the, the uh, conversations we've had with SpaceX have been purely about the mission, which is maximum impact for maximum number of people. Uh, and, you know, we'd deal with it at that time, but we're, we're confident that uh, the relationship and the partnership that uh, we've got with SpaceX will, uh, will deliver in 2024.
So your resilience plan is your reckons on Elon Musk being reliable. This is the guy who threatened to turn off Starlink after um, falling out with Ukraine's ambassador to Germany. He's taken away the New York Times' Twitter tick over a spat with them. He's your resilience plan? Uh, SpaceX is our resilience resilience plan. Um, you know, Elon has a bunch of views on a bunch of different things, and he'll decide what he wants to decide. And but he acts on them, this, and he acts on them through his companies, though, doesn't he? Uh, well, he does. But what I would suggest is that the Starlink service that has provided been provided to New Zealanders through the cyclone has been extraordinary, and uh, many businesses and homes that have relied on that. Uh, haven't been focused on Elon Musk. They've been focused on essential connectivity that it's provided. And we don't see that the satellite to mobile service will be uh, any different. So are you going to maintain and expand your tower infrastructure as a backup? Well, we don't see it as a backup. We see it as complementary. So this is, you know, sending text messages and uh, and phone calls to space. And so um, there's going to be a, a latency and a, a capacity issue. So we are expecting that, you know, farmers and boaties and dock workers and people who are tramping and rock climbing will be able to have uh, text messages and phone calls, but they're certainly not going to be streaming Netflix like they do when they've got 4G and 5G connectivity. So this is really about solving the parts of New Zealand right out, you know, to the territorial boundary from a water perspective where it's just not affordable for any telco to uh, build out a mobile a, a mobile network where so we. So you're have going to expand and maintain. You're going to expand and maintain Correct. your existing system. Okay. Yes, we are. Yeah. Thank you for your time, Jason. Appreciate it. Jason Paris there from One New Zealand. He's the chief executive, formerly Vodafone. Twenty three after five, and you're with checkpoints on RNZ National. <laughs> We would love your feedback about anything you've heard on the programme this evening. The Prime Minister wants lobbyists to lose their swipe cards to Parliament. About 80 are apparently issued at the moment. Stuart Nash not standing for the election in October, so bowing out of politics. And what do you make of that deal between One New Zealand and SpaceX? Elon Musk is, uh, that's his company. Text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or you can email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. We would love to hear from you. It is time for the headlines with Evie. Ko Evie Ano Tene. Lisa. The Prime Minister says he's asked for more than 80 individuals involved with business unions and non government organisations to lose their swipe card access to Parliament. It's part of a move to make politics more transparent after an RNZ investigation into lobbyists and their communications with MPs and government agencies. Chris Hipkins has also asked officials to look into options for regulating lobbying. Sacked Cabinet Minister Stuart Nash is to leave politics at this year's election. He's going after a series of mistakes, including disclosing secret Cabinet conversations to two donors. In a Facebook post, Mr Nash says his decision follows a long family conversation. A recruitment specialist says some overseas nurses are using New Zealand registration as a way of getting into Australia. The managing director of Tonics Health Recruitment, Kate Natras, says some contracts can pay as much as two or three times what nurses earn in New Zealand. Donald Trump's lawyers insist he's ready for a fight as he prepares to fly to New York for a court appearance. A grand jury's indicted him over his alleged role in a 2016 hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The former president denies any wrongdoing. And there's confusion this evening over who controls the city of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine. Russia's Wagner mercenary group has raised the Russian flag over Bakhmut's city hall. But a top Ukrainian army official says its forces are still in control. Those are the headlines. Looking at traffic, give me one moment. Here we are. In Taupiri, just north of Ngādua Wahia, due to a police incident, State Highway 1B at the Taupiri-Huntley off-ramp northbound to the Gordonton Road roundabout is closed, and that closed just after 5pm. State Highway 35 is now open between Tolaga Bay and Therpuya Springs. Waka kotahi. Thanks you for your patience. Our next traffic news and headlines are at 540 and thank you for your patience, Evie. <laughs> After an unlikely 20-point fight back at Shark Park, the Warriors have moved 
moved into second on the National Rugby League table behind the unbeaten Brisbane Broncos. It's lofty heights Warriors fans haven't been used to in recent years. That's an understatement. With only one loss in five rounds, the Auckland-based club is on track to make the top eight for the first time since 2018. We're joined by sports reporter Felicity Reid. <gasps> Are you talking it up, Felicity? Is this the Warriors year? Well, that we're even throwing that around five rounds into a 27-round season suggests this is a bit of a different season for the Warriors. There's a lot of belief around the club, and after that 32-30 win over the Sharks yesterday, that's been described as a miraculous comeback, one of the most miraculous victories in the club's 28-year history. So those in the know are really sort of backing it and saying at this point that this really is a season and maybe it is the Warriors year. But the man that's been sort of given a lot of the credit for turning this around and giving them some place at this top of the table is the new coach, Andrew Webster. And we can hear what he has to say about this. We're a different club, so what's in the past, I know everyone keeps talking about it and it's fair enough, I suppose, because everyone think it will fall over soon. And after 15 minutes, they probably thought today was the day, but um, the boys had different ideas. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but we're... Our pre-season's been very hard and they've worked hard and they've bought into everything. So one of the players that's really brought into this is Sean Johnson. He is profiting profiting from uh, Webster's ways with these with the team this year. And there's a bit of a twist in the tail in the win over the Sharks. If we remember, Sean Johnson played three seasons with the Sharks. He's the one that landed the long-range penalty yesterday, which was the match winner, and has given some momentum to this Warriors side. If anyone has seen some images of him wandering around in a moon boot in the Sydney airport, don't be worried. He says it's just a corked calf and the physio wanted him to wear that moon boot on the way home because it's a bit of a flight if you're an athlete. Yeah, he was very gracious about winning against his uh, his old team, I thought. Anyway, um, let's move on to Erica Fairweather. We've got fingers crossed tonight. She is trying to write her name in the record books, isn't she? She is. The 19-year-old swimmer from Neptune Club in Dunedin. She's trying to become just the fifth woman to go under four minutes in the 400-metre freestyle. So she's been smashing 200 metre records at the New Zealand Champs over the weekend and in the heats for the 400 metre freestyle this morning she went 4 minutes and 9 seconds but she was first in her heat, first in everybody's heat, she's a long way ahead of the rest of the New Zealand talent but worldwide there are those other people that have gone under the 4 minute mark. Uh, 16 year old Canadian Summer McIntosh, she set the world record at 3 minutes 56.08 last week in Toronto. But actually, the first person to do this was back in 2009, and that was Italy's Federica Pellegrini. And then in 2014, American Katie Ledecky, who is just a bit of a legend in this sport, she set the world record at 3 minutes 56.46. And then last May, Australian Ariana Titmus set the world record again, which is the one that Summer McIntosh just broke. So these are big names, and it's kind of like a golden generation for Erica Fairweather to be seeing herself amongst some of these names. So she can crack that tonight, and I think she's going into that final heat, uh, and sorry, into the final in about 40 minutes' time in Auckland. Yeah, and hopefully gas in the tank there. Thank you so much, Felicity. That is sports reporter Felicity Reid there. The Cook Strait ferries have hit yet more troubled waters. Four Bluebridge sailings are cancelled today, leaving more than a 1,000 passengers on the wrong side of the strait. It's the latest in a string of cancellations by both ferry companies. Somia Barmedi Party reports. It's almost six weeks since Dunedin resident Callum Pawsey was forced to abandon his car and luggage in Wellington. He and his partner were booked to sail home from a North Island road trip in February, but the voyage was cancelled at the last minute. The couple had to fork out hundreds of dollars to fly home instead. Not even 12 hours notice prior to our sailing, we got a text message saying that our ferry crossing had been cancelled and our options were to rebook online or click on the link for a refund. The next alternative ferry crossing was in one month's time. Or so they thought. The couple booked new flights and were due to travel back to Wellington last week. But as they were about to head to Dunedin Airport, another text arrived saying the sailing was cancelled. With the extra airfare fees, the couple's now $1,500 out of pocket and still hasn't heard about compensation from Bluebridge. But Callum Pawsey says they're better off than most. My auntie has capacity to hold on to my vehicle, but if I was paying for storage in the airport or another facility, it obviously would have cost a lot more. So I guess in the scheme of things, there is a lot more people out there that could be a lot worse off. Bluebridge says today's cancellations are because of a technical fault with the Feronia vessel. But there's no word yet on what the problem is or whether it'll be fixed today. 
The company says it'll work with customers on a case-by-case basis about extra costs they've incurred. Meanwhile, the Inter-Islanders Kaitaki ferry has been out of service since early March because of a gearbox issue and won't be running until at least Easter Monday. Both companies are stretched for space, with Bluebridge telling customers travelling with vehicles today a refund is the only option. Marlborough Chamber of Commerce boss Pete Coldwell says that's not good enough. We have to have a way that when you've got bumps from one of the crossings, that you have to be able to get on one of the, one of the ones coming up. Um, and I know that means more disruptions for others, but the fact that you've got a car there and they say, no, you can't get on for three weeks, that can't be acceptable. He says the number of cars parked long-term in Picton is beginning to increase again following the latest cancellations. And it's not just individuals that are being impacted. Pete Coldwell says businesses are scrambling to help stranded people, while also dealing with disruptions to supplies. This is effectively the de facto state highway. It affects supplies, it affects transport, so it affects all of the businesses there, and it just makes things more difficult than they would otherwise be. And I think the other tricky thing is obviously the reputational damage. It's just not good for Marlborough or Wellington either. The Transport Minister is blaming previous governments for the disruptions, saying they've failed to plan for the long term. Michael Woods says the current regime is investing more than $430 million on two replacement inter-islander ferries, but the first one won't arrive until at least 2025. He says in the meantime, he's asked Kiwi Rail to come up with a plan to make the crucial route more reliable. Callum Pawsey's hoping for third time lucky. He's booked another ferry in another four weeks. Like many others, his fingers are crossed for smooth sailing this time. Somia Barmedi Party reporting there, and we would love to hear from you if you've got some problems getting across the Cook Strait, if your ferry crossing has been cancelled and you're in the queue for a rebook, let us know how you're going. Text us on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. It is 27 minutes to 6, Kiamo Tonimai. You're listening to Checkpoint on RNZ National, and it is time for the business news. Kotaku Hoi in INA called Giles Beckford, who joins us live from the Wellington studio. Okay, Giles, the Reserve Bank is, get, gets more house lending rules ready to go. Tell us more. Well, this is debt-to-income ratios. I've been speaking about them for quite a while, but successive governments have always held them back, saying no, 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 no. Uh, The current government gave them the go-ahead in principle, but on the base condition that any scheme that they designed needed to uh, minimise the impact on first-home buyers. Now, the way debt-to-income ratios work Basically, the amount that you're allowed to borrow would be a ratio, a multiple of your income. So you earn $100,000, they set the level of debt-to-income ratios at six, then you're allowed to borrow $600,000. They're established in a lot of economies overseas, and they are seen as one way, in particular, of taking the steam out of a hot housing market and curbing, perhaps, uh, property investors. Um, it feels a little bit like this is uh, shutting the gate after the horse has bolted. But, of course, you know, it was would have been perhaps more appropriate at a time when interest rates were rock bottom, house prices were going through the roof, uh, and everybody was borrowing like there was no tomorrow. You know, uh, a slowed market that's showing likely to show few signs of real recovery for another two to three years. There's every likelihood that this will be put in place. It'll be sitting there on the sidelines. The banks have been told to be ready to bring it into force in a year's time. But there's a good chance that actually it won't be used um, in the foreseeable future. They'll continue to rely on loan-to-value ratios as perhaps one way of putting a few breaks on any resurgence in the housing market. We'll wait and see how that goes. But at the very least, the system's there. They've worked out the definitions. The banks now have 12 months to be ready for it. Oh, and we'll have more on the rolling mall that is the house market later in the week when the OCR is announced, eh, Giles? Oh, but- we will. <laughs> we will indeed. Don't you worry about it. In fact, look, this is the time when we get three or four property results, uh, sort of uh, reports in the space of 10 days. Uh, anybody who has, you know, property porn um, fixation, you can get your fill at the beginning of every month.
Okay, let's talk about small businesses now. More of them have got their backs to the wall. That doesn't sound good, Giles. It doesn't. It's an MYOB survey. That's for the business accounting uh, software firm. Um, they've done an annual survey looking at more than a 1,000 businesses. Um, people are down in the dumps. Isn't everybody about the economic outlook? Uh, and they're no different. Uh, but they're saying their costs on average have risen about $1,500 a month. This is the overheads in the past year. Uh, which for small businesses, and we are talking you know, businesses that are employing 20 or fewer people more often than not, um, that's quite a whack. Rising interest rates and inflation, of course, uh, are the chief criminals here. But for a lot of them, they're saying they could last six months, perhaps on the way they're currently trading, and then they'd have to dip into their savings or they'd have to go along to the bank or some other lender to raise fresh finance to keep themselves going. And they say that if there was a real serious recession, then perhaps one in ten of them would go to the wall. Now, you'd say, small businesses, so what? They employ several hundred thousand people in the economy. We're talking perhaps towards uh, close to half a million uh, people in the economy, uh, even though they only make up about, say, 20, 25 percent of the economy. But they're vitally important for a lot of small communities. They're small businesses. They're big employers. Um, they are sort of one of the economic backbones of this country. So, yeah, times are looking a bit tough and grimmer for them. They tend to soldier through. But uh, you know, a warning sign here from this survey that uh, times are going to be pretty tight for them for the, at least six months or perhaps a year. And Giles, the highs and lows from the market today, please? Well, it never really got out of bed. It was a pretty dull day for uh, the local share market. Uh, some big losses for some of the bigger companies. The top 50 index down 46 points. That's about 0.4%, just under 11,900. The New Zealand dollar, 62.2 US cents, 93.3 uh, Australian. As we were talking reserve banks, the RBA has a rate decision tomorrow. Will it hold or will it go up 25 basis points? We have our own one on Wednesday, 25 basis points or 50. That's the choices at the moment. Thank you, Giles. That's Giles Beckford live from our Wellington studio. It is uh, 28 minutes. No, it's not. It's 24 minutes, something like that. Anyway, I can't tell the time today. To six, your checkpoint on RNZ National. Evie will look that up for me. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, let's do some feedback. Uh, on lobbyists, um, yeah, some of you have strong feelings about this. Lobbyists should all enter by the front door like the common herd. A list of who sees, who they see should be published. Brian of Namotu. Hi, Brian. Thanks for getting in touch. Uh, this one too. Good on Hipkins for trying to sort the lobbyists, although I suspect donations will get in the way of justice. A lobbyist should have no more access to pollies than Joe Bloggs signed Joe Bloggs. Dogs. This one too. They shouldn't be helping lobbyists set up their own codes of conduct. They shouldn't be making lobbyists accountable. On the issue of Starlink, and this is the deal between One New Zealand, formerly known as Vodafone, um, and Elon Musk's company. Uh, this person says, Elon Musk is part of the cure, not the problem. Starlink and Tesla user. Cheers from Ian. Another, though, says, if Elon Musk is our telecom backup, then I say we need a backup for our backup. And that's not even worrying about filling low earth orbit with junk more spacex space junk great not says another listener and this i don't like elon musk on a personal level but if using his satellites means i can communicate with my loved ones in an emergency i'll happily pay for the service lobbyists having swipe cards for parliament buildings nope says Lenny. Um, and on the fairies, this has captured a few of you, what is up with our fairies? Uh, this listener says, over the last 50 years, fairies hardly ever broke down. Now they're breaking down all the time. Maybe because they're the same fairies and they're getting a little bit old. Who knows? Homai or Fakaro, we would love your feedback. Do keep it coming. You can send us a text with your thoughts on anything you've heard on the programme. It's 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or the email address, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Time to go to the headlines now. Anaya Evi, Mina Pitapitakoreiro. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins says it was Stuart Nash's decision to retire from politics at this year's election. The Napier MP today announced he was stepping down after a series of mistakes. He was sacked as a minister last week and is now the subject of a review into his communications with donors. 
Mr Hipkins also set out the terms of reference for the Cabinet Secretary's review of Mr Nash's communications. It will include letters, emails and texts and messages sent via WhatsApp and Signal. The government has signalled possible law changes to make the lobbying industry more transparent. More than 80 lobbyists are losing their swipe card access to Parliament. A further 25 deaths have been attributed to COVID-19. 12,202 new cases were reported over the past week, 944 more than the week previous. 5,149 of the latest cases are reinfections. Ukrainian officials say a deadly explosion at a cafe in St Petersburg shows that domestic t- terrorism is breaking out in Russia. There's no indication yet of who was behind the blast that killed Vladlen Tatarsky, a pro-Putin blogger. At least 25 people were injured. And one of the most prominent and influential indigenous leaders of the past century in Australia has died, aged 74, after a long illness. Yuna Pingu was a trailblazer in the fight for land rights and the constitutional recognition of indigenous people. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese called him a great statesman. Those are the headlines. Looking at traffic state, Highway 35 is now open between Tolaga Bay and Tepuya Springs. And north of Ngāru Wahia at Taupiri, a police incident has closed State Highway 1B at the Taupiri-Huntley off-ramp northbound to the Gordonton Road roundabout. Our next news and weather is at 6 o'clock. No mihi, Evie. The clean car discount has accelerated purchases of low-emission vehicles, but the wheels have come off the government's claim the scheme would be cost-neutral. Toyota's CEO says the government has miscalculated the number of cars bringing funds into the scheme and the massive increase in sales. Simon Lucas of Simon Lucas Mitsubishi has seen sales skyrocket at his dealership on the North Shore, and he joins us now. Kia ora, Simon. Is it a success or a failure, this scheme? Well, I guess it depends on who you talk to, really. I mean, uh, for the companies that have uh, vehicles which qualify for the clean car discount and and the consumers that want them, it's been a massive success. Has it paid for itself, though? Because that's a measure of its success. So, I mean, are you seeing the vehicles where they're paying a tax on them? Is there enough of those being sold to cover the ones where you get a discount? Well, abs- absolutely not, because like any incentive, it's going to direct people to make their purchase decisions in the area that's going to give them the best advantage, and and that's towards electric cars and not towards vehicles like Utes, which uh, uh, are taxed rather heavily. So do you think the scheme needs a tweak? It's difficult to see how they can tweak the scheme without having to dip into the taxpayer's pocket, I think. Um, the uh, amount of the clean car discount that's uh, rebated to the electric vehicles, uh, electric vehicle owners is actually quite high, and the penalty on the ute buyers is actually quite high. So it's very difficult to see how they can, they can, they can balance that in a, in a time where um, they're trying to limit taxpayer spending, um, uh, government spending in, in, a, in a cost of living crisis. So it's probably something that they should be doing in the first year of an election cycle, not the last. What about um, narrowing the field for, for which cars can get a, a rebate on them? Because, I mean, part of the argument is if you can spend up to 80 grand on a car, do you really need a subsidy? Yeah, well, everyone wants a deal, um, even if you're spending 80 grand. So um, that's one of the reasons it's been so successful. And um, taking, you, you could, for example, what's been, been suggested is take out all the combustion engine vehicles, which are low emitting vehicles, to to save uh, um, to save that money, which you can then cross subsidise to uh, for the higher emitting vehicles. But really, at the end of the day, the, the low emitting vehicles are a very small proportion of the market. So, if you look at your sales, Simon, what percentage yep. are, are pure electric vehicles? You know, in terms of the vehicles that attract a subsidy. Yeah, uh, the Mitsubishi product lineup has two plug-in hybrids, which are um, battery. Uh, powered vehicles which are augmented by a petrol engine, so predominantly electric vehicles. So we, the Eclipse Cross and the Outlander, and, and before the clean car scheme came in, that was about 10% of our sales. And within about three months, it then became 70% of our sales. Okay. Have you heard any rumours that there will be a policy rewrite on this one? 
Yes, we have. Yes, yes. What are you we, hearing, we feel Simon? There's one coming up. Uh, we we understand that um, there is going to be something happening, but we're not quite sure whether it's economics or politics. Um, so, what we, do you mean by uh, that? What do you mean by that? You're not sure if it's economics or politics. What What do you mean? Well, I think that that there's a constituency which will say that why are we using this money to subsidise like you say, wealthy people into electric vehicles at the expense of people that can't buy electric vehicles. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, I think so. that's the, the, the politics of it. And I, I think the economics of it is that it's not cost neutral, which is what they said. So we'll leave that to the politicians to decide what, what they want to do. So have they given you, and by that I mean the politicians, an indication yep. that there is some kind of rejig to this scheme on the way? We haven't heard anything at the retail level. We're, we're not quite sure what's happening at the distributor level, like say Toyota New Zealand or Mitsubishi New Zealand. So, but we, yeah, so we haven't heard anything clear coming to us from either our distributors or uh, or um, from the government themselves. So uh, we just a, a, await the advice that we're going to get. How many of these cars would you have on back orders? Currently. Uh, Two or three hundred. And how long do people have to wait? And which ones are you waiting for the longest? The ones we're waiting the longest for is our Outlander PHEV. We we do have some current supply of our uh, uh, our Outlander PHEV. We do have some current supply of our Eclipse Cross, which puts us in an actually pretty good com- uh, position compared to some of the other distributors. And the wait about how long? Uh, wait is about a, uh, about nine months to a year for the Outlander PHEV, um, and for the Eclipse Cross, two or three months. So there must be a little bit of concern then, and you must be slightly concerned that people who have ordered up a vehicle, thinking that they're going to get some kind of subsidy if it doesn't arrive in time and the money doesn't change hands. What happens to them if the scheme changes? <laughs> It would be very difficult to see how the government could penalise people that have made a decision in good faith to purchase a vehicle uh, on the basis of receiving a rebate and then for the government to retrospectively change the scheme so that they are out of pocket. So you think they should honour the scheme even if they were going to make some changes in the short term? Honour those people? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, It It would seem to be really unfair to those people that have made those decisions. Uh, and and all the uh, distri- distribution and retail networks that support them uh, to then then say that they they are no longer el- eligible for the rebate. Good to talk to you, Simon. Thank you for your time. That's Simon Lucas of Simon Lucas Mitsubishi on the North Shore. It is twelve minutes away from six. Kiamo Tony Mai, stay with us. You're listening to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Occupation. Chicken milliner. Yep, it's a thing for Australian woman Mandy Watts. Don't snigger, Evie. The Toowoomba resident is a master on the crochet needle and her impeccable creations, see what we did there, hats for hens, attract international attention and buyers. You're not going to believe these. They're amazing. Mandy explains how she hatched the unusual idea. I saw on Instagram my friend had posted a picture of one of her chooks in the nest box wearing a little cowboy chicken hat. And I thought, oh, that's so cute. And I just thought, oh, I could crochet a little hat. And yeah, went from there. Tell us about some of the designs you've made of these chicken hats. Uh, The most popular is the Santa hat with the beard um, and the witch's hat, because a lot of my followers are from America. So Halloween's a big thing over there. So they like dressing up the chickens in the witch's hats. Um, a lot of bonnets, um, bunny rabbit hats for Easter. Um, I've done probably everything you can think of. People send me requests. Um, I've just done a helmet for, uh, what is it? Ice hockey in America? With for a, a chicken. A, yeah, for a chicken. <laughs> How did you get from basically, you know, crochet peggy squares to these things, which I would, they're art, Mandy, what you're making for Um, chickens' heads? From YouTube. I I can't really follow a pattern, so I watch people make things on YouTube. I I learn by watching and, um, yeah, I'm very creative. I've always been a really good knitter. I could knit just about anything and so I just sort of 
turned over to crochet, I guess. Have you got any of these hats within reach here, Mandy? What do you got? Well, oh, This is the little witch's hat. So it's a complete hat with hair attached, yes? Yeah, that's the little Santa hat with the beard, so the chicken's little face comes through there. Yeah, and the, and the little beard hangs underneath the chicken's face with its beak yeah. through the hole and then a Santa hat yeah. on the top. Yep, loving yeah. them, loving them. Um, that's the little <gasps> Easter oh, that, bunny hat. That is a winner and so appropriate coming up to Easter. So this yeah. is a full bunny with um, a little yeah. bunny nose, bunny ears, and some pom-poms yeah. attached to tie it under the chicken's to chin. Yep. Yeah. And these are, these are really popular, the little bonnets. These look so cute. And that is like a little Bo Peep bonnet yeah. for a chicken. Yeah. Now, how yeah. do the chickens react to these? Because you have bantam hens, I understand. Is yes. that right? Well, look, I can't speak for others, but my little bantams, when they're broody, when they're sitting on the nest and they think they're hatching eggs, the poor little things, and mostly they're not, but they don't realise that, they sort of go into a bit of a trance. So I put the hat on them when they're broody and basically I don't think they know they're doing it. <laughs> um, but hang on, some, some broody chickens will peck your hands off but some are really placid, so you pick the placid ones. And you use them just basically for a quick photo snap. They're oh, not kind of left yeah. on for ages. Yeah, it's just, honestly, it's a matter of seconds. I just sit it on. Sometimes I tie them, sometimes I don't have to, and I'll take a quick snap with my phone and that's it. So yeah. you, you do it for what purpose? Do you get joy out of this? And obviously Love other it. people get joy out of the creations. I just, I love it. I mean, it's turned into a part-time little business hobby now, but initially it was, people got so much joy out of it and they would, um, my followers on Instagram would just love it and then suggest another type of hat. And it was always a bit of a challenge to see if I could make the hat and then everybody loved the pictures and it, it just sort of grew from there. It so, makes people happy. When people ask you or you have to fill out a form, what do you write down as your occupation? I, I say I have a, a crochet business on Etsy. But so. actually, actually, you are a chicken milliner, aren't you? I am. I am. And a crazy one at that. <laughs> a milliner to the chickens. I am. Yeah, and it's cracking Evie up. She didn't believe it. It's true. Um, and we will put that story online in a link. You can see the chickens modelling the, the hats. Anyway, teen waka armour paddlers have their sights set on further glory after the high school champs in Rotorua. More than 1,500 toira from across the Motu paddled on Blue Lake for the first time since 2021. Ashley McCall spoke to some of them. Hamilton boys. Making it to the 125 metre first. Outside of Dunterangiani, one you are. They've got a commanding lead now. Hamilton Boys High racing ahead to take out the under 19s. Their six paddlers taking out the 250 and 500 metre sprints. It was year 13 student Rico Calton's second time competing at the Nationals. He says being able to win two races was rewarding. I could tell the boys were feeling like super proud. Yeah, the energy was there. Yeah, and the boys were just super happy. It was really tight. Um, all the boys, I could tell by the other schools that they were coming after us. You could tell the pressure was um there, but we just stuck to our game plan and then hope for the best. He says the right mindset was the key. We pretty much started off the water, telling all the boys to uh, yeah, bring their A game and, you know, we wouldn't mix and mingle with, our, with those other schools or we would stay under our tent and, you know, focus, relax and get ready for our races. He's now trying to find a club so he can compete at the Wakaama National Sprint Champs next year. 16-year-old Maya Campbell, who's the current world champion for under-16 and 19 sprints, has his sights set on this month's long-distance champs. Today, he's flying over to Tahiti for special training alongside some of the coaches there. The tired Afati teen, who's the son of Kiwi Campbell, one of the biggest names in Wakaama, won his first 250 metre sprint last week. But Cyclone Gabriel made training difficult. We had to go to Rotorua and train out of there for about a week or so to help with our long distance training also. So yeah, that was really something different. It was real hard too because the roads, most of the roads were closed. So I was real grateful for that.
It's also the first time Te Eringa Māori from Taranga Girls College has competed at nationals. She won the under-16 250 metre sprint on a double-held waka. Oh, we were just happy. <laughs> yeah, that was about happy, like, surprised. Because when we went to um, nationals, we weren't really getting good um, results. And then we, get, we came here, we got really good results. It was a tight race too. They won by only one second against Aroa Mata from Rotorua. Not talking a lot on the boat, so then you can listen and stuff. I don't want to come second, I want to come first, so keep pushing. Waka Ama New Zealand Chief Executive Lara Collins says despite the rough conditions, the competition across the past week has been tight. It was a little bit chilly on, on Wednesday and Thursday, just four degrees and uh, quite windy days, which made it challenging but also quite exciting on the water so um, yeah there was just lots of excitement lots of good racing close racing and happy people everywhere on the land and the water. Many of the teams are now looking to the world long distance championships in August. Well, some of Auckland's most famous beaches on the West Coast still closed due to the impacts of Cyclone Gabrielle. Surfers are travelling further to get their fix. Security cordons remain in place across Muriwai, Karikari, Piha and Bethel's beaches and only small groups are allowed in, such as those with pre-booked surf lessons. Luca Foreman explains. With much of the West Coast still inaccessible by road, Surfers in Auckland are making the trip to beaches like Te Arai Point near Mangafai on the northeastern coast of the region. It takes nearly an hour longer than the drive to the west coast, but surfers say the northern beaches are getting more and more packed. No doubt about it, yeah, yeah. Everybody's out here from like people that usually go to like Murawai or Bethels or uh, Piha and stuff, yeah. Ryan says the extra commute means he now has to think twice before heading out for a day of surfing. It's a bigger decision to make to drive so much further in a day for yeah, you know, a couple hours of surfing. Dan says the extra people in the surf can lead to some tricky situations. I saw one guy um, dropped in on a wave and then the other person had the right of way. So he grabbed the board, at the other dude's board, and just like pulled it from under his, under his feet as in like, this is my wave, get off, you know? He says he'd usually try to get out to the West Coast about once a week. So it's been a shame to not be able to go. It's been a bit of a bummer that, you know, the last couple of months the sun's been amazing. And it's, it's just been, it's sad not to be able to get out there. It's, it's, those are beautiful beaches. Chris says with the extra visitors, he's seen a higher quality of surfers than he usually would on the northern beaches. Definitely a few people out here. I know a lot of uh, West Coast locals were out here this afternoon, like the Havens, and they were ripping. Normally you don't get that kind of level of um, surfing ability up here, so it's always nice to see what's possible on these waves. Security cordons are still in place across the West Coast, but Auckland Council is allowing small groups of people to be shuttled in, such as those with pre book lessons at the Murawai Surf Club. Piha Surf School founder Phil Wallace says there are still concerns around security for red stick at homes, as well as worries about the volume of traffic on the area's fragile roads. The big one is just having people come in randomly who don't have as much responsibility or care for the community. It's just It would become really difficult for the police and the security to keep tabs on general public coming to Piha right now. Mr Wallace says he supports small groups of people being taken in and out of the area for a specific reason. And I think if people are guests with specific purpose that come into Piha, then I don't see that that's a problem. Auckland Council says it will review whether the West Coast cordons will remain in place after Easter. Deputy Group Recovery Manager Mace Ward says the decision to close these areas to the public wasn't made lightly, but they have to put safety first. He says council will communicate with West Coast communities as they make decisions. Meanwhile, back up in Te Arai Point, one East Coast local says whilst the waves are likely to be crowded over Easter, it's all part of the fun. A bit more packed, a few more kooks, a lot of fun, love it. <laughs> Okay, a quick bit of feedback on the ferries. This person says we've got a friend from Germany staying due to travel from Picton to Wellington tonight on Bluebridge with a car. Booking cancelled. Next available booking, 5th of May. RNZ News at 6 o'clock. Nga mihi o te po. Good evening, I'm Evie Ashton. The Prime Minister has signalled a clampdown on lobbyists, scrapping their swipe card access to Parliament and exploring options for regulation. The move follows an RNZ investigation into the conduct of lobbyists and their communications with MPs and government agencies. Chris Hipkins says he's asked officials to report back with regulation options next year.
Perception is incredibly important here, and so making sure that the, um, in addition to our actual practice, you know, being democratic and transparent, that actually perceptions reinforce that as well. Chris Hipkins is also encouraging lobbyists to develop a code of conduct and is offering help from the Ministry of Justice. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has revealed the terms of reference into the review of MP Stuart Nash's communications with his donors. Mr Nash has announced he'll retire from politics at the election. He was sacked as a minister last week after it was discovered he leaked confidential Cabinet information to donors to his campaign. Chris Hipkins says the Cabinet Secretary's review will look at letters, emails, texts and messages sent via WhatsApp and Signal. The test here, the, the, what we're, I guess, trying to establish or trying to make certain of, trying to provide some reassurance of, is that uh, the minister concerned wasn't providing any information that people who were donating to his campaign were gaining additional advantage from having. The review will cover the day Mr Nash was sworn in as a minister in 2017 to the day he was sacked. The former chair of Te Whatu Order claims the new national health entity can't do its job properly because it's too undefined. Rob Campbell has levelled a series of criticisms against the health system a month after being sacked. In a copy of a speech sent to RNZ, he says the reforms are hindered by structural issues and a failure to implement things. Mr Campbell believes it's possible for the problems to be remedied but admits that the board under his leadership should have done better. Meanwhile, a recruitment specialist says some overseas trained nurses are using New Zealand as a way of getting into Australia more easily. The managing director of Tonics Health Recruitment, Kate Natras, says New Zealand is competing globally for nurses. We are finding we're putting quite a lot of resources into supporting them to get the New Zealand Nursing Council registration, but then finding that they are using that to go to Australia on. So we, we try to sort of filter that out as best we can. However, Kate Natras says New Zealand has a lot to offer overseas nurses, not just in terms of pay and conditions. She says many are attracted by the fact they have a pathway to residency and can settle here with their families. Donald Trump's lawyers insist he's ready for a fight ahead of his expected appearance later this week at a Manhattan court. The former US president's indictment by a grand jury relates to his alleged role in a 2016 hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Correspondent Benji Hyer reports. Right now, the charges remain sealed. But on Tuesday, while their former president is fingerprinted and his mugshot taken, Americans will learn exactly what he's accused of. Until then, his lawyers are pushing their narrative that it's a political persecution and abuse of power. Trump's attorney Joe Tacopina is describing his client as a warrior. He's someone who's going to be ready for this fight. Um, we're ready for this fight and, and I look forward to moving this thing along as quickly as possible to exonerate him. Donald Trump denies any wrongdoing. Even a conviction won't disqualify him from running for the presidency again. A Cook Strait Ferry customer who was $1,500 out of pocket because of cancellations believes he's probably better off than most. Bluebridge has cancelled four sailings today because of a technical problem with its Feronia vessel. Dunedin resident Callum Pawsey was hoping to take his car on the ferry, but he's had to leave it in Wellington after his ferry was cancelled in February. Another sailing he booked on last month was also cancelled, but Mr Pawsey still thinks he's one of the lucky ones. My auntie has capacity to hold on to my vehicle. If I was paying for storage in air for or another facility, obviously it would have cost a lot more. So I guess in the scheme of things, there is a lot more people out there that could be a lot worse off. Kellen Pawsey is hoping the third ferry he's booked on sails. A former president of Kosovo goes on trial at a special court in The Hague tonight to answer charges of war crimes during the armed campaign for independence from Serbia in the 1990s. Three former army leaders are also on trial. The BBC's Anna Holligan reports from The Hague. Hassan Thaci co-founded the KLA, a paramilitary force that sought to secure Kosovo's independence from Serbia. He and other former commanders are accused of killing nearly 100 people and other atrocities including enforced disappearances and torture. They're suspected of targeting Serbs, Roma and ethnic Albanians considered to be traitors or collaborators with Serbian forces. Victims and human rights groups hope his trial will reveal what happened to some of the thousands of people who vanished during the Kosovo conflict. Mr Thatchy and the three other men deny any wrongdoing. 
The Tauranga City Council is asking residents not to throw batteries in curbside bins after multiple fires. A recent fire caused by a lithium-ion battery at the Tauranga Recycling Centre is the seventh incident in the past year. The council says batteries can be recycled safely at specialised centres throughout the city. And Australia's cricketing body and its players' union have announced a landmark deal that could see women cricketers earning on average 66% more. Cricket Australia says cricket now offers the best earning opportunity of any team sport for elite female sports people. The body is keen to retain and attract top players as the popularity of the women's sport increases. That's the news. I'm Catherine Ryan. On Nine to Noon today, new bidders emerge for Ruapehu Alpine lifts. We speak to the first out of the blocks. The National Arboretum's treasured trees are in strife post-cyclone Gabrielle, and so are the finances. David Vass, mountaineer and owner of a canyoning business whose life changed in an instant. Our commentators analyse a torrid political week and the former cattle breeder now making plant-based meat snacks. With me on Nine to Noon on RNZ National. And we're funded through New Zealand On Air. You're back with Lisa Owen next on Checkpoint. Right now, the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Tuesday. From Northland to Whanganui, including Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty and the Central High Country. Isolated showers today, possibly heavy and thundery about eastern Bay of Plenty, fine tomorrow. Apart from early fog patches and a few showers about western Northland. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, showers becoming widespread and heavier this afternoon with thunderstorms possible in the north, becoming fine tomorrow. Monawatu to Wellington also waded upper. Scattered showers clearing to fine this afternoon or evening. Nelson and Marlborough isolated showers today, mainly fine tomorrow. Buller and Westland mostly fine today. Cloudy periods and isolated showers later tomorrow. Canterbury and Otago mainly fine. A shower or two about eastern Otago tomorrow afternoon. Southland and Fiordland showers about the fjords and south coast. Isolated showers elsewhere tonight. And Chatham Islands often cloudy with showers. It's seven minutes past six. I'll have news headlines for you at 6.30. Kia ora e ho. No mai hoki mai. This is Checkpoint. Ko Lisa Owen tēnei. Motorists between Manawatu and Hawke's Bay will have to wait until 2025 until a new highway linking the regions opens. The $620 million replacement to the closed road through the Manawatu Gorge was expected to be finished late next year, but that date's now been pushed out. Our reporter Jimmy Allingham checks out the new road's construction. Tricky ground conditions are the reason the eagerly awaited replacement for the former State Highway 3, which shut due to rockfall in 2017, will open behind schedule. A lot of the challenges that, that were faced across the project being, I guess, you know, that high artesian water pressure, uh, being able to get a good start on our piling on Bridge 2, COVID and the, and the real impacts that that's had on us as a project in terms of shutdown and supply chain issues. That's Grant Cody, spokesman for Te Ahua Tūronga, the new highway. He says the Project Alliance is working out what effect this will have on the new road's budget. So we're assessing that at the moment and what that looks like. But with every sort of, you know, programme extension, you can expect some sort of additional costs that that they get tagged with that. But we're still in the process of looking and and what that assessment looks like. So another six months for motorists to use windy, slow alternative routes. But progress has been made on the 11.5 kilometre four-lane new highway more than two years into construction. From the Palmerston North End, at Ashes, the road climbs over two 300 metre long bridges which are behind the delays. One, over a wetland, had an unusually large amount of groundwater where its piles go. The key for us was to drop that water level. How we'd done that was by dewatering, basically pumping the water out, and that's allowing us to basically have a reasonably dry area to, to then start uh, piling. The Parahaki Bridge over the Manawatu River also presented unexpected challenges where its piles went. But Mr Cody says its piers were undamaged in Cyclone Gabrielle. With the water that was coming from over the other side and the Manawatu two was just a natural funnel uh, for a lot of that water to come through. What we experienced was just the high volume of water, some of its sort of highest levels seen since 2004, which we've experienced, and they come through with quite a bit of debris, and the debris predominantly made up of logs. Those logs caused only minor problems on temporary structures for the bridge's construction. 
further up the lower slopes of the Ruahine range, the landscape is changing. Our total earthworks volume across the project is 6 million cubic metres. We've moved just a scratch over 5.2 million cubic metres. So yeah, we're nearing the completion of our earthworks, having those substantially complete and, and to be honest, ahead of time as well. So, so we're really pleased with how that's going. Soon it will start to look like a road. So we're doing pavement trials now and also on the Ashu side, you can see us actually building our pavement and getting that ready and prepped up. So uh, yeah, making some really good inroads there. Mr Cody takes us to a site overlooking one of the biggest pieces of earthworks. Yeah, so we're in Cut 13. Further south you can see uh, Cut 12. And so this is where I guess the majority of our earthworks has been, I guess, completed, so substantially completed. Just a touch over 2 million cubic metres has come out of these two uh, areas alone. So uh, you see it's starting to get some really good shape. That shape makes it look like the Transmission Gully Road north of Wellington, and it's just as steep. The top of the hill among wind farm turbines had its own tricky tests too. In zone 3 our challenge here has been ground conditions, quite wet and so that's uh, required us to do a series of, of undercut which is basically excavating out areas which is unsuitable material and, and backfilling with suitable material. Six years to the month since the old road closed and motorists now at least have certainty for when their wheels can hit the tarmac of its replacement even if that's later than first thought. To the US now, and Donald Trump is gearing up for battle ahead of his appearance on Tuesday at a Manhattan court. He's expected to fly to New York City from his Mar-a-Lago home tonight to face charges related to hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels. The former president won't be handcuffed, but other details of the arraignment remain a mystery. The ABC's Jade McMillan has more. In the area around the Manhattan courthouse where Donald Trump is set to appear, life goes on as normal. But come Tuesday local time, this will be the site of an unprecedented spectacle as he becomes the first former US president to face criminal charges. Joe Takapina is one of his lawyers. He's gearing up for a, a battle. Um, you know, this is something that obviously we believe is a political persecution and I think people on both sides of the aisle believe that, that it's a complete abuse of power. The former president is expected to fly to New York City from his home in Florida tomorrow, spending the night at Trump Tower before making his way to court. Mr Takapina has told American ABC the details of the appearance are still being finalised. I've done a million arraignments in that courthouse um, with, with celebrities and whatnot, but this is a whole different thing. Um, we have Secret Service involved. Um, I understand that closing the courthouse for the afternoon. Um, I, I just don't know what to expect to see. Hopefully, what I, what I hope is that we get in and out of there as quickly as possible. The charges against Donald Trump remain under seal, but they're believed to relate to hush money provided to adult film star Stormy Daniels in 2016. His former lawyer, Michael Cohen, says he was directed by Mr Trump to pay Ms Daniels $130,000 US to stop her from speaking out about an alleged affair. Mr Cohen has since turned on his former boss and will likely be a key witness. This is not what so many people want to make it look like, oh, it's Michael Cohen's vengeance against Donald Trump. That's not what this is about. This is solely about accountability. I should not be held accountable for Donald Trump's dirty deeds. Many Republicans, including those expected to challenge Donald Trump for the presidential nomination, have rallied around him, but not former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson. I don't believe he should be the next leader of our country. He's just announced that he's entering the presidential race and wants Donald Trump to drop out. First of all, the office is more important than any individual person. And so uh, for the sake of the office of the presidency, I do think that's too much of a sideshow and distraction. Donald Trump is still considered the leading Republican candidate and he's already scheduled a press conference in Florida in the hours after his court appearance suggesting he'll fly straight home and try to take control of the narrative. It's almost a quarter past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. The Finnish Prime Minister, Sana Marin, has lost a nail-biting election race to the country's Conservative leader. That's despite the 37-year-old staying high in the poll ratings, being praised for steering Finland towards entry into NATO and for navigating the pandemic. And it was late last year Ms Marin visited New Zealand to meet with the then Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. The BBC's Emma McCarthy reports. 
Relief and celebrations for Petteri Orpo after a nail-biting election. You can see that I'm very happy. This, this was great victory for Kokomus. I think that Finnish people want change. They want change and now I will start negotiations, open negotiations with all parties. Mr Orpo and his National Coalition Party claimed victory late on Sunday with 20.8% of the vote, ahead of the right-wing populist Finns party and a swing away from the centre-left Social Democrats. It's a bitter defeat for Prime Minister Sanna Marin, even though her party looks set to increase its share of seats in Parliament. This is a great day because we've done well in the elections. Congratulations also to the coalition party and to the Finns. Democracy has spoken, the Finnish people have cast their votes and celebrating democracy is always a wonderful thing. Miss Marin became the world's youngest prime minister when she burst onto the political scene in 2019. Now at 37, she steered the country to within days of NATO membership and has been praised for Finland's response to neighbouring Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. But at home, she's become a polarising figure. She came under scrutiny last year when a video emerged of her singing, dancing and drinking at a party, as well as her government's public spending. For Mr Orpo, it's now down to business, as he vows to fix Finland. I want to build trust and cooperation between parties and, and build up the strong uh, majority government. After a stint in hospital, Pope Francis is back in action ahead of a busy Easter weekend. He's led a Palm Sunday Mass at the Vatican just a day after being discharged. The BBC's Jenny Hill has this report. There was a determination about Pope Francis this morning, a desire, perhaps, to get back to work. But just a day after he left hospital, he cut a rather frail figure. His voice, at times rather hoarse, as he led the Palm Sunday Mass. I thank you for joining me and also for your prayers, which intensified in recent days. I truly thank you. For worshippers here, a prayer answered. It's the most important time of the church year, and Pope Francis is now expected to preside over a gruelling schedule of Easter services. But his hospital stay has intensified speculation about his longer-term future. Pope Francis has indicated repeatedly that he would stand down were his health to fail him. He's 86 years old, he has a number of significant health complaints, and many here wonder whether that time might come sooner rather than later. For now, celebration. The Pope clearly delighted to be back amongst his people, reassuring the faithful of his devotion. One of Australia's most influential Aboriginal land rights leaders, Yunu Pingu, has been remembered as a tough campaigner and an inspiration to his people. The 74-year-old has died in the Northern Territory. The ABC's Jane Barden reports. Until just before his death, Yuna Pingu had the ear of politicians, including Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, at his Gumach clan's annual Gorma festival in East Arnhem Land. He was a leader in Australia's land rights movement from a young age. As governments inched towards recognising some rights, he kept telling them it wasn't good enough. This is a revisit to our waterholes to poison it yet again. This is rounding up Aboriginal people into the valleys and a final shootout. He acted as a translator in the Gove land rights case in which Yolnu elders tried to stop the Nabalco bauxite mine going ahead. They didn't succeed, but the struggle helped to persuade the federal government to pass Northern Territory land rights laws in 1976, which gave traditional owners veto power to stop mines and other developments. And from 1977, he was chair of the powerful Northern Land Council for 23 years, helping many traditional owners get their land rights legally recognised. Binmila Yunapingu is his eldest daughter. He's never stopped fighting for all your rights through his work through Northern Land Council, community voices, through Karma, 
He's tried and tried and tried. We have never really gone anywhere. It's like the song Treaty, the promises are broken, just like riding in the sand, because our people are struggling. He helped to negotiate the terms of uranium mining at Ranger on the edge of Kakadu National Park, a rule which saw him recognised in 1978 as Australian of the Year, when he again gave his forthright views. In law, we still have no land. We have no title to any land. In the 1990s, he denounced Australia's proposed native title laws as giving traditional owners only limited rights to negotiate about how their land is used. We reject the Commonwealth Government's position on the proposed legislation. We want legislation based on native title to advance Aboriginal rights to land. Bin Miller Yunapingu again. His totem is a fire and he's burnt fires here and there. Hope that we can all do the same and carry that legacy. Ian Pingu was also a guiding force for his brother Mandawoy's band, Yothi Yindi. And he helped lead the push for a treaty when the Barunga Statement painting, now hanging in Parliament House, was presented to Prime Minister Bob Hawke. Let's celebrate the next 200 years of Australia jointly. There shall be a treaty. His clan had a win when the Land Council and Prime Minister Julia Gillard endorsed a massive deal with Rio Tinto over the disputed bauxite mine on their land in 2011, although it caused tension and unsuccessful court challenges by other Gove Peninsula clans who felt the benefits weren't fairly shared. Now we are at uh, a beginning of a time where, whereby mining company and uh, Aboriginal people in this area can get along differently to the past. Yuna Pingu said he wanted young Yolnu people to follow his lead and his daughter Bin Miller still hopes that'll happen. His work from day one, his life story, I hope that that can inspire other Yolnu people to come through and become that next leader. Even if we're ignored, at least a voice is there to help us carry on. In eastern Ukraine, Russian shells are bombarding Ukrainian homes. At least six people have died in the past day. Since the war began, Ukrainians have been living in terror and in many cases without reliable access to basic necessities like food and water. One American has jumped into action delivering water to battered parts of Ukraine. CNN's Ben Wiedemann reports. Without water, there is no life. And the clean water pouring into these plastic jugs is a vital lifeline for people in the battered eastern Ukrainian town of Siversk, just six miles from Russian lines. Retired building contractor Andre Anderson from Oregon is an unlikely carrier of water. It was just a calling that I couldn't refuse to do. I can't sit at home and allow, allow this to happen without helping the people who need help. He's part of a volunteer group called Aqueducts. Their routine simple, but essential. We turn up, they turn up with their little jugs, and we just fill up their jugs or their buckets or their cow pails, and uh, they go away happy, and we empty our tank, we drive home, and then we come back in the afternoon, and we do the same thing, and we repeat on every day. The few remaining in Siversk tell the usual story, dogged attachment to their land and no other options. How can I leave, asked Tanya. My son is buried here, and where would I go with my small pension? Andre's colleague, Silvia Pavica from Austria, was a tour guide. Why, why are you doing this? Um, to help. It's just the right thing to do. 73-year-old Mikola appreciates the water, but thirsts for quiet. I'm fed up with his shelling. Nobody needs it, he says. What passes for daily life ended long ago. The center of Siversk is a wasteland. The early spring snow softens but can't hide the jagged edges. Voda! Andre shouts out water, voda, in Ukrainian. Soon residents emerge from their basements, their bomb shelters. Basic humanitarian services like this are critical. There hasn't been any running water or electricity since the beginning of the war. With no end to this war in sight, they're resigned to a fate 
bleak. It's fine, says Valentina. We put up with everything. What can we do? Yet 70-year-old Nina despairs at what has become of her town. What do we feel, she asks? Pain, pain. When you see something destroyed, you tear up. We cry, we cry. Bottles now full, they return through streets, cold, muddy and ravaged, to their shelters. The renowned Japanese composer and producer Ruichi Sakamoto, admired for his electronic music experimentation, has died aged 71. He won awards including an Oscar, a Grammy and BAFTA for his work as a solo artist and as a member of the Yellow Magic Orchestra. The BBC's Tim Allman has more. Haunting, melodic, timeless. Ryuichi Sakamoto's theme from Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, a fusion of East and West. It has become one of the most famous pieces of film music of all time. But it was for his work on Bernardo Bertolucci's The Last Emperor that Sakamoto really made his name, winning an Oscar, a Grammy and a BAFTA. On social media, tributes poured in. Professor Brian Cox, himself a former musician, tweeted, he leaves a magnificent catalogue of music behind. Legendary British guitarist Johnny Marr described him as an elegant and timeless artist. And the trip-hop group Massive Attack called him a genius and a gentleman. Ryuichi Sakamoto was born in Tokyo in 1952. Inspired by Debussy and the Beatles, he began studying composition at the age of 10. He set up the Yellow Magic Orchestra in 1978, his pioneering sound earning him the mantle of the grandfather of electronic pop music. In later life, he also became an environmental campaigner. In a statement, Ryuichi Sakamoto's management company said he continued to create work whenever his health would allow. He lived with music until the very end. Let's have some of your feedback before we head off now. I've got a lot of reckons on the ferries and the current problems. This person says the situation with the inter-island ferries is shambolic, to say the least. Thousands of people weekly are having their lives turned upside down. The ferry companies have no plan to deal with stranded passengers. In a country that is split in half by a piece of water, how have we got to the point where this has been allowed to happen? It is unbelievable. I know people that are afraid to book crossings uh, they, as they are afraid they won't get back. That from Glenn, and here's a person who finds themselves in that situation. I have had to endure four ferry cancellations eight weeks and near 3k in rental car expenses trying to get my personal car to Dunedin for university. Hugely frustrating, poor communication and burning holes in my pockets. Ouch, says Kauno Flavel. Um, On the subject of nurses heading over to Australia, uh, this person says, nurses with New Zealand registry should have immediate or at least guaranteed residency, uh, e.g. work for 18 months guaranteed, else they will jump on the plane and get immediate residency in Oz and their family joins them in weeks, not years. Keith has got in touch to say, how stupidly self-defeating can we be? Training up these nurses only to lose them across the ditch because we haven't got the decency and sense to pay them properly on chickens and hats for chickens in our interview with the chicken milliner. Now that all New Zealand chickens get to live outside, hats might be welcome over the winter, says Martin from Littleton. Well, Evie will love that sentiment. Um, That is about all we have time for this evening. Now, the Late News team will keep you updated throughout the night. If you missed anything from the programme, you can find Checkpoint on Spotify, Apple or wherever you get your podcasts from. Ko te koupapa tuatahi a popo tomorrow from 5am on First up, they ask whether removing swipe card access to Parliament for political lobbyists goes far enough. Yeah, it's an interesting story. Tune in at 5am. 
RNZ News at 6.30. Good evening. I'm here with the report called Evie Ashton Thimney. The Prime Minister is encouraging lobbyists to develop a code of conduct as the government moves to make their activities more transparent. More than 80 people involved with business, unions and non-government organisations are losing swipe card access to Parliament. Embattled Napier MP Stuart Nash, who was sacked from Cabinet last week, will quit politics at the next election. Russia's Wagner mercenary group claims it now controls the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. And Donald Trump says charges relating to hush money paid to an adult film star are political persecution. The former president's due in New York for a court hearing. Those are the headlines. Our next news and weather is at seven. Pacific waves. Bringing Kiribati back into the forum. Diving into the big stories of the region. They are an instrument of the constitution of Fiji. And shining a light on issues affecting Pacific peoples in Aotearoa and around the world. Being able to go out into different places and areas that share special connections with our community was really special. We tell a to Pacific leaders, newsmakers, 